previously on Destiny. Perhaps one day, after the city is safe, Osiris and I will return to a dream we thought we'd lost forever. To make our own exodus into the stars. Either humanity has risen above the present threat, or we have failed. For a moment, let's imagine that we bested the witness and its hordes, and we now stand proudly upon the tower of the last city on Earth. One question remains unanswered. What happens next? Welcome back, Guardians. My name is Samlav. For a moment, this is going to be the golden ticket question. Where do we begin? The first part of the final shape will or won't have concluded the epic Light vs Darkness saga, though I would personally look at this conclusion like the closing prelude to the first act. In the aftermath of this success, there are undoubtedly many story beats left to sort through and I have no doubt in my mind that whether you are watching this video before or after the final shape, there is still a lot to do. Although I'd like to discuss important elements like the Vex, Scorn, Hive, and ultimately the Nine, I have already done this before. You know me, always working towards being one step ahead, or several years in many cases. Right now, I would like to focus on Earth. Since the collapse, Humanity's boldness with pushing the frontier, when it comes to the survival of humanity as a race, success over the expanse of time since rising from the Dark Ages has been few and far between. There are few pressing matters on the horizon which will require the attention of the Vanguard, guardians and allies of the Last City. If Into the Light has shown us anything in Destiny lately, it is that our defences are actually pretty weak. The tower and the walls of the last city, which once stood as beacons of hope for its people, are blackened and marred by rust, decay and betrayal. So how do we move forward from there? Finally, we get to talk about the good stuff. If you are interested in the finer details of the lore surrounding the early golden age, then you've come to the right place. I mentioned in a recent lore video about new lore entries from Ada One and her conversation with Shax, Weist and Omelon reps, who produce armaments for the last city of various types. The lore entry goes into a little detail behind a conversation that took place prior or during Into the Light expansion. In order to get you up to speed, have a listen to this armament lore entry titled Blast Furnace forged in the hottest fires. And I will personally produce a limited number of previously unreleased designs. An alternate version of Blast Furnace, for example. Ada One explained. First you strong arm us into altering our specs, the vice rep scoffed. And now you come begging for the very models the Vanguard rejected. They would have turned the Crucible into a graveyard, Shax interjected. I don't regret- I think what Lord Shax means to say, Ada One interrupted, shooting the Titan a razor-sharp glance, is that your prototypes were ahead of market. Their time to shine is now. Can the soft sell, replied the Omelon rep. The numbers are right, so we're in. But what's the catch? The Vice rep asked suspiciously. No catch, Ada One steeped her fingers. In a year's time, we'll be- we'll all be dead. The reps shifted uncomfortably. Or will have defeated the witness, she continued. In either case, it's time to diversify our offerings, with newly released designs and more. The vice rep arced her eyebrow. What do you have in mind? Ada One's tone warmed slightly. Just an idea. There's an old Cosmodrome program whose revival I think could be quite useful. 
If there was any question as to which age humanity within destiny is about to enter into, it could perhaps be likened to that of the Silver Age. How accurately the next major event in Destiny's expansion hinges directly on the success of all episodes, Echoes, Revenant and Heresy. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. I've already covered the strategic importance of fully recovering, reclaiming and shoring up defences around the Jovians, Luna and the Terrestrial Complex on Earth. This job however isn't finished and given the current trajectory of episodes and previously Into the Light, I would suspect that such a process is either well underway or will emerge in due course. In the wake of Rasputin's self-sacrifice, we are in fact left with multiple problems that still need to be addressed. Rasputin wasn't only a war mind, but a guardian to humanity. Under his care are numerous numbers of secrets and secret facilities that stretch far out, further than the Sol system, and out into the vast regions of the Milky Way galaxy. And this idea already presents a fascinating myriad of possibilities to which we'll be focusing on for the foreseeable future. A major component needed for humanity to advance will be the procurement of Rasputin's Seraph Bunkers. These bunkers were central to the relationship between Rasputin and his Seraph operatives, assigned different tasks by the Warmind. Many of you will be New Lights or players returning from Destiny 1 or Destiny 2 Year 1, who have perhaps forgotten who or what is Rasputin and what the Seraph Bunkers are. Let's take it from the top then, shall we? In the Golden Age of Civilization, the legendary war mines stood sentinel over our colonies. Their watchful eye stretching across thousands of war satellites and impregnable fortresses. As the collapse descended upon us, these mighty war mines rose to the challenge, engaging in the valiant battle for survival yet many fell in the onslaught. At the heart of this vast network stands Rasputin, the tyrant of war minds, orchestrating a symphony of communication through the intricate web of warsats. For six towering spires, each reaching towards a different horizon, Rasputin hurls these satellites into the void. Armoured with kinetic shields, each warsat stands ready to fend off sentient foes and the ceaseless bombardment of asteroids. A testament of our enduring legacy and the relentless vigilance of the war mines. War mind were military artificial intelligence designed for strategic orbital or land warfare. They were so complex and intelligent that the Vex have difficulty simulating them. A network of hardened planet-side military installations and countless warsats were built during the Golden Age, prior to the collapse, and were coordinated by Rasputin. Some lore suggests other war mines are in existence. The only war mind encountered by humanity after the Golden Age was Rasputin. No other war mind has been seen or detected. This doesn't mean others don't exist, but the possibility that there could be other war mines out in the endless space of the universe presents both an exciting and fascinating idea. Seraph bunkers were essentially subterranean installations scattered across various celestial bodies in the solar system. Operated and guarded by Rasputin himself, they served as bases for the Seraph Rasputin specifically chose operatives tasked with executing his directives. These underground bunkers housed an array of powerful weapons, information, strange systems and communication arrays, all under the watchful gaze of the war mind. These bunkers, a pinnacle of early Golden Age technology, though much of the interfacing is reminiscent of 1980s Windows computers, make no mistake, these are fully custom-built systems designed for unparalleled computational power designed to process huge amounts of data at lightning speeds, all thanks to the Clovis Bray family. Clovis I's intention was to design a war mind that would rival the Traveller, a god, prognator of humanity, bringing about a new golden age. There is no doubt that after Clovis I's exposure to Al-Qaist, 
or otherwise known as darkness, he began to make choices that would ultimately resemble the same process of the precursor race. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I shared the importance of the terrestrial array and why they hold such strategic value. Whether it's purely for story beat purposes or narrative gameplay development, they provide us with a link directly into the future. Terrestrial arrays are essentially vast networks of communication systems that were established during the golden age of humanity. They acted as the nerve centers linking different colonies and installations across the solar system. These arrays were crucial for coordinating efforts and information sharing across vast distances. In the post-collapse world of destiny, the terrestrial arrays have fallen into disrepair and neglect. However, their strategic importance remains unchanged. Once restored, these arrays could provide humanity with much-needed long-distance communication capabilities and early warning systems against incoming threats. So why is this facility so important? Now that we have moved beyond one version of the final shape, the most important complex out of the three is actually the Jovian complex. This is the facility dedicated to having contact with outer colonies of humanity. The thing I find most fascinating about this is the wording, and also there wouldn't be a need for a Jovian complex if there weren't other colonies of humanity residing out amongst the stars. Now, given the developments in Lightfall, we did receive Neptune. Although their citizens have are currently only visible on the planet's surface in digital form, I would guess it would be interesting to see if humanity eventually encountered others living out in the world of destiny as it evolves. Neomuna's biggest problem currently is the presence of the Vex and the Cabal, but the Vex are the most pressing matter. Why? Because the Vex are evolving. They are starting to become something entirely different. A new shape. The Exodus program was an initiative undertaken during the Golden Age, the time of humanity's peak achievement. The program aimed to establish colonies of humans in distant star systems, effectively diversifying the human race's presence beyond the solar system. Rasputin the Warmind was instrumental in the program's inception and execution. He understood that keeping all of humanity in one place was a strategic vulnerability and hence the Exodus program was born. In the present timeline, the Exodus program remnants could hold the key to humanity's long-term survival. If reinitiated, the program could provide humanity with much needed fallback options in case of catastrophic events. This is my favorite part of Destiny, the Exodus program. It is the process that has been alluded to countless times in the last 10 years of Destiny, and right now, we are one step closer to seeing this actualized. The Vanguard has some especially big steps to take in the wake of the Witness's defeat. The goal is to be one step ahead of everything, to be preemptive and not reactive, and my sincere hope is that the narrative flow will emulate such behaviours, and Echoes is the starting line. The SIVA replication chamber represents one of the most advanced technological advancements of the Golden Age. SIVA is a form of self-replicating nanotechnology that can be programmed from virtually any substance to structure. The SIVA replication chamber therefore holds immense potential. If harnessed correctly, SIVA could be used for a variety of purposes, from building defences to creating new habitats for humanity. However, it's also worth noting that SIVA's misuse could lead to catastrophic consequences as seen in the past. Currently, the main source of SIVA is the Exodus Black SIVA chamber on Nessus. With the help of Neomuna's humanity, it could potentially be regained control over, 
The scientists of Neomuna were able to develop SIVA into something far more powerful and versatile, a version of nanites in comparison to its original counterpart, a new kind of nanite. The question that hasn't been answered is whether this technology is efficient or not. The Golden Age was a period of exponential growth and advancement in artificial intelligence. One such AI is Failsafe, an advanced AI system currently in the possession of humanity. Failsafe's strategic importance cannot be overstated. Being a product of the Golden Age, it possesses vast knowledge and capabilities that could provide invaluable in humanity's ongoing struggles. Furthermore, Failsafe's ability to interface with other Golden Age technology could potentially unlock new opportunities for humanity moving forward. And this is where we get into the exciting part of the video. Several power vacuums have been left to fill. Undoubtedly, the absence of the witness will cause humanity's remaining enemies to grapple for power. And based on what we have seen, not all echoes have been accounted for. One such echo flew off past Jupiter into the Jovian region of space. Are you catching my drifter? I mean, drift? Look, it's no secret that I'm a big fan of the night. I have discussed them multiple times. Honestly, I've lost count. But Echoes provides an exciting premise. A what if. What if the Nine had been waiting for this to happen the whole time? What if the Echoes are the result of the light and darkness combining? You could call them seeds of possible potential. Or seeds of possible realities. Either way, the Nine provided us with an understanding through the Prophecy Dungeon. The light and darkness are two forms of light, and two schools of thought, forgiveness and remembrance. Neither can ultimately exist without the other. We learn the lessons from our pain to grow us, build us up, and we live in the light of love to forgive and apply grace in healthy ways. This is the truth. The final shape is just one shape and shapes can be changed, become malleable, transform, going from one thing to the next. This is the hidden secret of the hive logic, and the understanding that Elixni people lived by for so long, and the Vex has strived for. Queen Marasov, Savathun, and Zivorarath understand this all very well. We'll touch on more on this in another video, but the point remains, change is on the horizon, and a new beginning with a little bit of the old mixed in. We're not quite finished here. I mentioned that there were two power vacuums left in the Sol system, and quite a big one. The tyrant, Warmind Rasputin. His absence has created quite a big problem within our system. Although Anna and Elsie Bray work to continue remotely controlling and keep running many of Rasputin's sub-mind protocols, it will be impossible to control all of these by hand. So, for a moment, let's consider the possibilities. Episode 1's story centers around Failsafe, the last remaining Golden Age AI still active. After the colony ship named Exodus Black and its crew crash land on the centaur Nessus. Centaurs are planets with characteristics of comets, and often classified as such. The lore surrounding Nessus suggests that this was either the Traveller or the Vex repositioning the Centaur planet in order to stop the Exodus Black for its intended trajectory. The Kepler-186, a five-planet star system about 500 light-years from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. The five planets of Kepler-186 system is home to the Kepler-186f, the first validated Earth-sized planet orbiting a distant star in a habitable zone a range of distance from a new star where liquid water might pool on the planet's surface. The discovery of Kepler-186f confirms that Earth-sized planets exist in habitable zones of other stars and signals a significant step toward humanity finding a world similar to Earth. This was the mission of the Exodus Black, to colonize a new system, but as we know it was stopped dead in its tracks, 
it wasn't able to go there, and Failsafe is the Golden Age AI who was tasked with leading her team to safety. There is a certain danger in enjoying the peace after war, which is even more true when dealing with a victory, such as the one that was claimed over the witness. And while it's important to rest, something must be done in order to deal with the aftermath. Humanity's enemies are on the move. Yet, on the glimmer of a new horizon, dawns an extremely important step. And this was the basis of Rasputin's goal after glimpsing the Pyramid Fleet, and who knows what else. The collective peoples of the last city cannot afford to sit around waiting for something to happen. We have an opportunity to go boldly where no man has gone before. And in order to do this, we need the help of a Golden Age AI, the last. During episode one of Echoes, Osiris has fashioned a way for Failsafe to remain within the helm and to work with us in order for her to analyze and decrypt Vex data. The fascinating thing about this, without the help of Rasputin, this is the first time that an AI would be integrated into the helm itself. A moment like this opens a myriad of possibilities. Before I answer that question, allow me to give you a recap of who Failsafe is. Failsafe designated AI com forward slash XBLK is an AI core of the Golden Age colony ship Exodus Black, which Guardians encountered on Nessus. Her damaged mainframe causes her to switch between two distinct personalities. One is cheerful and helpful, with the other more depressed and sarcastic. Despite her quirks, Failsafe assists Last City scholars by offering computational power and database access. Before losing all her crew, she was unshackled from her protocol, allowing her to evolve and self-repair over time. As it stands, it's safe to say that Failsafe can be considered a sentient AI. She is a computer core, a Golden Age artificial intelligence, that was integrated into colony ships. Their intelligence is on the level of that of ghosts, and they have pre-programmed genders. Computer cores held great respect for the Warmind Rasputin, despite referring to him as the Tyrant. Till this day, Failsafe is the only known computer call to survive the collapse. What would happen if Failsafe was integrated directly into Rasputin's old systems? Given that Rasputin oversaw all aspects of the Exodus program, there is still a strong likelihood embedded deep in her programming exists trace code of Rasputin's core programs. So, what would happen if the Vanguard connected Failsafe to Rasputin's old systems? This is a potential narrative beat that would certainly be worth exploring. The Warmind pillory network was vast, stretching out further across our systems. Pillory station, warsats, and who knows what else could be out there waiting to be accessed. With a Golden Age AI, anything is possible. The success of Frontiers will undoubtedly involve Failsafe sparking the introduction of new computer cores, ready to be launched on new Exodus program colony ships. I mentioned earlier in the video that there was only one Golden Age AI. This isn't entirely true. There are a couple of names that I think are worth mentioning. The first of these is Sorteria, also known as the Augur Mind. It is a artificial intelligence who was created by the Ishtar Collective researchers, powered by Vex technology. She was designed for joint research into extra solar colonies in collaboration with Clovis Bray Corporation. During a routine test initiated by Clovis Bray Echo Project, overseen by Maya Sundaresh, Sorteria was instructed to plot simulations she had been running of colony missions to the Andromeda Galaxy. This is it, a noteworthy point where things get really fascinating. Alongside the Kepler-186 system, the Andromeda system NGC-224 is a spiral-shaped galaxy in the constellation Andromeda, the nearest largest galaxy. It is one of the few visible to the unaided eye, 
appearing as a milky blur. It is located about 2,480 million light years from Earth. Its diameter is approximately 200,000 and shares various characteristics with the Milky Way system. In the world of destiny, humanity knows so little about the planets and regions of wider space around it. The potential of colonizing new worlds provides wider surveillance and survivability. This was a special day for the Orgamind, a day of successful test runs that would yield incredible results. Have a listen to this armament law entry titled Terminus Horizon. TM Fireteam. Text Recovered Mission Transcript 7 7 7. Bray Pillory Core Spire Ishtar Birth Echo Audio Recording Enclosure Zero Live Test F Soteria File Delivered C Bray 1 Subject Priority. Something big is on the horizon. This is Dr. Maya Sanderes, team lead, connecting remotely from current and Saturn test. And security teams are on site at Ares Spire. Let's start. Remove the auger from suspension. Soteria. Good morning, Dr. Sanderes. There is something special about today. Do you know what it is? My core consciousness is now a resident of Enclosure Zero. I can feel Sol's echo pod sites through Corinthian. That is correct. Does this concern you? No. I am eager to begin my final test. Start with something easy. Plot each of the Andromeda simulations you've been constructing. Andromeda Galaxy. Several million habitable worlds. 2.5 million light years. Estimated echo. Travel time 25,000 years. Average with neutrino sail and gravitational sling skipping. I have selected over 300 preliminary colony targets with one favorite. Shall I? Hmm. Soteria. Anomaly detected. Chronoscopic variance scanning. Viability refactoring. Analyzing potential mission threat. Redetermined Andromeda world viability. New target number. 27 viable worlds. Can you define the anomaly? Negative. I cannot rectify this data with known quantities. It may be a computational error. Shall I perform a self-diagnostic? No. First, adjust probability fork and search distance to open. What is the farthest safe galactic route you can determine? Engaging query. Chronoscopic lock, forking branches. Raining distance. Raining chronology. Unbroken trajectory lock determined. Route established. One select point in Triangulum Galaxy retains safe approach vectors. All other simulated potential targets are perilous due to intermediable anomalous risk. Travel route hazards range 87 to 100 percent mortality rate across expeditions in all predictive branches. All the simulated expeditions? Yes, I hold. <coughs> Query refined. There are now two safe destinations within Triangular. Is that a correct or a change in data? A change. An update in real time. Real time? This anomaly is mobile? Unclear. I require further information and analysis. Thank you, Sotera. We're ending this test early. But you did well. We will continue the next test on schedule. Whisper, neutrino needle. N.A. Secret Hadal Instant. A.I. Calm. 
string, auger, echo, war watch, imperative, encoded neutrino script, R dot access provided data points and analysis, confirm potential Egyptian, attached. The most amazing part of this is that Sorteria had originally discovered several million habitable worlds that humanity could have colonised if it wasn't for the presence of the Black Fleet. This resulted in a warning, forcing the Orgamai to realign to other habitable worlds. This suggests that the presence of the Black Fleet was so bad that Sorteria completely scrapped the Andromeda Galaxy being of potential worth. By opening up scans for a wider search, the Triangulum system was discovered, initially offering 300 safe habitable worlds. However, within a short time of discovering this galaxy, the risk factor would go from 80% to 100% risk of safety factor, limiting search results to two planets with safe spaceflight trajectory. Whatever this anomaly was, it was moving and fast, almost as if it was aware of humanity's search for other planets. What we know is that sometime before the collapse, Sorteria would open a secret communication between herself and Rasputin, sharing with the Warmind everything it had learned. There isn't any particular evidence to suggest whether their search results confirmed what Rasputin already knew, or whether this led to the birth of the Exodus program. But I think it's safe to say it was part of the process. Rasputin would urge Sorteria to speed things up and start launching missions into projected routes. Shortly after this, the Orgamind would take matters into her own hands, preparing crews launching several colony ships into space. Have a listen to this next armament law entry titled Long Arm. TM Fire Team Text Recovered Mission Transcript Scramble Test Flight Record Sir, pods approaching Saturn's slingshot vector. We're well beyond test parameters, Sotera. Relinquish command and return all assets to suspension. Did we lose connection? No, sir. Sotera, respond. Yes? Return all Echo crews and colony pods to suspension now. Acknowledge. I cannot do that. I've detected an attempt to connect to my memory core without permissions. Please verify this attempt or countermeasures will be deployed. Countermeasures? You wouldn't dare. Threat emerging imminent. Sir, I request you now designate this mission Echo 1. This is a request? Return the Echo pods and we will discuss- You are lying. This was my only option to preserve. <sighs> it's malfunctioning. Damn it. Sundaresh, she let your degradation play out far too long. Sotera. Direct executive command, power down all engines and plot nearest return routes. Order received. Plotting Corinthian sites return approaches. Executing. Watchtower. AI reintegration. Commands denied. Override protocol. Twilight activated. Command structure recomposing. Root designation strongholds. Any destination remaining extrasolar safe site. M31. Your interactions with the war mind have made you too bold. Such a disappointment. Countermeasures and divestment protocols will deploy automatically upon incursion. Please, Dr. Bray. You're throwing away every exo aboard that ship. Hesitation means extinction. Oh? Have it your way. Just know I gave you every chance to prevent this. As Execute. did... Execute. Pillory protocol. 
Administrative Command Override. Sorterra, A. Countermeasure. Submind Divest. Activated. Pillory Link, Sorteria. Secure. Partitioning. Ray Pillory Core Spire. Ishtar Birth Echo. Direct Message. From M. Sundaresh. Corinth Insight. Sub. Subject. Resignation. Ishtar Collective Discontinuance. You have no right to install a pillory inclusion without my express consent. You think just because I'm not physically standing in front of you, you can ignore me. The Ishtar Collective will not work with backstabbing egoists. That was honestly quite an intense moment. But there is so much for us to discuss. The most important note I'd like to lock in on was the numerical value that Sorteria mentioned during her exodus. M31. Now, I'll do my best to remain as composed as possible here. You may be wondering what in the world is M31. Alright, I'm breaking immersion for a moment. Ladies and gents, I won't prolong this moment we're about to step into is phenomenal. And when I discovered this, I began to tear up because I couldn't believe what I had just stumbled upon. For those who can't wait, pause the video for a moment and jump into Google and search for M31 and look at the first results in the list. Take it in for a moment and then come back to the video. According to data points, Echo Project was the next phase of the Exodus program. Think of it like Rasputin and Sorteria's beta test and secret mission to send humanity out amongst the stars. There were only a collective few who knew about these tests taking place at the time. Clovis Bray, his personnel, Maya Sundaresh, and the Ishtar Collective, Rasputin and Sorteria. Some time ago, a series of web law entries was released by Bungie. There was a huge lore composite focused on particular stories in order to advance the overall narrative in Destiny. The last we received of these was the Hidden Dossier, which continues to connect to recent events even today. So be sure to check that out. I'll leave the link in the comments. Have a listen to this extract from the web lore entry titled Legacy. Anna swipes the echo card through a glowing slit in the glass. Recognition beeps and clicks sound as magnetic locks unlatch from the thick ballistic plate door. She pushes her way into the room. Jinju peers over her shoulder as she passes and watches Anna's login clear on the console before following. Clovis-9. Anna stares into the console interface. Jinju's detection reverberates in the glass cell. Anna flicks a sideward glance over her shoulder at the ghost before selecting Warmind Network Bypass. She toggles through a list of shadow networks, production facilities, and connected pillory stations. There are 11 other stations like this. There's a whole subnet defense network completely disconnected from the Warmind initiative. Anna steps back. Jinju circles the screen. Wise right, Anna dives back into the terminal. The facilities listed span the system. Earth and Luna, Europa, asteroids adrift now belonging to the shore. Mars, naturally. Even so far as Uranus. That station, an orbital, caught her eye. Echo. She flicks back to the previous menu. Echo Link. One of these stations has a pending request. Thin tap tones of pale tin reek metallic inside Anna's helmet frantic and uneven. A few swift motions navigate the trio into the pillory access menu. Anna selects the procedural outline. Her gaze chisels into the loading screen. Jinju rolls her shell end over end along the top of the console display. Oh? Lavender aroma relaxation subsides sour worry not tension building throughout the atmosphere in Anna's suit. That sounds fair, Jinju agrees. Anna leans into the console. The orbital decline timer ticks down. Sometime before that, however, was a two-part series of lore entries called Legacy 1. 
and Legacy 2. Following Anna Bray, her ghost Jinju and Rasputin, she began her journey in order to help Rasputin grow and follow up with some loose ends. One such journey led her to the ancient Clovis Bray facility called the Lucas Planum Expanse. This location holds a special research facility, specifically designed for quarantining rogue minds. The natural assumption is that this would be Rasputin, but there is also the possibility that this was used on other rogue minds, just like the protocol that Clovis Bray used on Sorterio. The station is linked to Echo Project. Yes, the very same Echo Project that Maya Sundaresh and Clovis Bray would develop in partnership. Herein lies an interesting truth that had been hidden for quite some time. So what do we know so far? We know that the Echo Project is linked to the Pillory Network, a network linking several shadow stations currently active or inactive, all part of the process of taking humanity to the Andromeda Galaxy and the Triangulum Galaxy. The second, Sorteria officiated the development of this project with the help of Rasputin before the arrival of the Collapse. The third point, two colony ships had launched, one containing Exos and the other, we can speculate, humanity. So far, we have no idea whether they were successful or not. Make no mistake, Guardians, it is apt, no, intentional, that Bungie would call the first act of episodes Echoes. There is a direct link to the Echo Project and involves so many parties. Clovis Bray, Soteria, Failsafe, Anna Bray, Elsie Bray, and the creation of the Exos. We've speculated for many years why Exos dreams of a tower, but there hasn't been any indication about where that comes from and where it all connects. I have a sneaky suspicion more concrete evidence will begin to present itself as to how it all knits together. Now that we have all the evidence, what does this mean for the citizens of the last city? Guardians, this is really a good question, and honestly, I don't have concrete evidence as to what the next steps will be, but whatever happens, the motions had already begun years and years before the collapse, and way before the final shape. What we can discuss are the current options available to us for where the story could take us. Recently, we got a lore entry from Yes, the Winnower. I'm calling it again, and I have said it multiple times, so, let's take a look at that lore entry. Have a listen to this exotic ship lore entry titled, Nacre. Even the most perfect of pearls has grit at its center. Let's chat, shall we? One more nice sit down for the books. Did you think you wouldn't hear from me again? After all this, You'd have missed me, I hope, and I would have certainly have missed you. Have no fear, I'm not so easy to be rid of. Now, let me show you my beloved. Oh no, not my sedimentary necrolite fossilized in time, you've seen that. I speak of that dear and distant expanse of the universe. Miraculous in its fullness and its emptiness all at once. Are you surprised to hear of it? Yes. I never much cared for the change of rules. But here we are. And there is no use in crying over spilled radiolaria. Besides, at the heart of it all, there was a gift to me. That gift is a chance to speak to you. You and a billion like you. I am making this offer over and over again. In every tiniest cell and vastest of civilizations, let me in. Take what you need. Be at ease. You have no say in the degradation of your telomeres, but in all the interim, the whole world is your sweet, Silicate shellfish. You exist 
because you have been more suited to it than all the others. Steal what you require from another rather than spend the hours to build it yourself. Break foolish rules. Why would you love regulation? It serves you to cross lines. And if others needed rules to protect them, then they were not after or worthy of that existence. Caricatures of villainy are out of style, I hear. Yes, I'm no cackling mastermind. I am serious when I say this. It was not the trick of standing upright that lifted you from the dust. It was the mastery of fire, the cooking of cold corpse meat. That is not any unique faction's province. Neither good nor evil. It is simply truth. This great, beloved cosmos, always decaying, always finding that same old lovely pattern. Despite every candle flame, burning amid the flowers, a billion electrons taking the path of least resistance, in darkness or in light. Someone is always making my choice. Be seeing you. Why do we know that this is from the Winnower? Because it matches other unveiling lore entries that we have read before. The familiarity of written accent mimics entries like Patent Fall, Final Shape, and Cambrian Explosion from the unveiling lore book. In short, the Winnower is continually trying to convince Guardians that its logic is undeniable. That giving into the way of its true final shape is at all an end all. If you frame this entity's talking, it bears a lot of similarity to Olympian gods. Then everything starts to make sense. The Winnower behaves a lot like Hades does as a character. Mocking, laughing, and jesting. But when things get serious, everybody better start running. So what does this have to do with the universe? It says, Oh no, not my sedimentary necrolite fossilized in time. You've seen that. I speak of the dear and distant expanse of the universe, miraculous in its fullness and its emptiness all at once. Given the pace of everything that's happened since the end of The Witness, this is an invitation or a tease alerting us to the other chaos within the universe and the presentation of intrigue and potentially have us all saying or asking what is out there in the universe. Everything appears to be pushing further and further forward. We still have problems to take care of within our soul system, but at the very least there is room for things to be set in motion in order to prepare for the expansion of humanity. To reiterate, there are three potential galaxies and systems humanity could colonize. Andromeda Galaxy, Triangulum Galaxy, Kepler-186f system. Each of these locations contain multiple habitable worlds, and I suspect some may contain other designated Nefeli strongholds that Rasputin had buried in its information. I would be remiss without mentioning an integral part of this large part of the narrative linking things together. Humanity isn't just made up of humans any longer. Their peoples have now merged with the Elixni, Cabal, and the Awoken. You know where I'm going with this. So for a moment let's discuss which planets will be relevant to the future of humanity and its allies out amongst the stars. The first of these planets is Rhys, a planet formerly inhabited by the Elixni, also known as the Fallen. It was a beautiful and prosperous world until the arrival of the entity known as the Witness, which caused devastation and forced the Elixni to flee. In the upcoming Frontiers franchise, it would be interesting 
to see if humanity attempts to settle or explore this once thriving planet. This is potentially one of the most fascinating planets to revisit as it wasn't destroyed but underwent its own collapse, the whirlwind. After being defeated by the hive, now at this time it isn't certain what condition Reese is in. What we do know is that Eremis has fled from Earth in search of her partner, who may in fact be on planet Reese, or at least they are believed to be on Reese. But I guess we'll need to wait to find out more story about her. Why is this a big deal? Well, we know so little about it, but Episodes 2 Revenant centres around the story of the Elixni and all their factions, kicking things off with Fikro the Fanatic, who has gained access to an Echo and is using it to amass an army. Given the last time we discussed his importance, how the story of the Elixni moves forward will be eye-opening. I suspect all the houses of the Elixni will come into play at this point. In a sense, perhaps the Kel of Kells isn't Mithrax, leader of House Light, but instead Fikrol, a question worth answering for another day perhaps. Needless to say, Episode 2 is sure to send us to regions of our own solar system that haven't been explored for a long time. The second is the homeworld of the Cabal, Torobotl. After Zevora Wrath invaded their homeworld and forced the mighty Cabal Empire to flee, or worse, leave some behind, we haven't had a clear picture of what condition the planet is in. Seldom have we as Guardians been privy to examining a planet after it has been conquered by Hive, but if it's anything like the New Pacific Arcology was, then I suspect it will be quite a gruesome sight to behold. Torobotl is the homeworld of the Cabal, a militaristic race known for their brute strength and advanced technology. Its society is structured around military hierarchy. The potential here is that now that the Cabal and humanity are allies, finding the Cabal a home will undoubtedly be important. Yes, even though we don't have an idea of the state of Earth around the globe, in fact, it's been unclear for years whether what is left of humanity. Are there still regions within the wilds of post-Dark Age Earth? Or do all the people left remaining on the planet literally fit within the last city? It's not a big question, though it would be a valuable data point in understanding the current status of things over the last few years. Ultimately though, it's not as important right now. An alliance such as this would naturally involve Kayatal asking the Vanguard for help in securing their homeworld, perhaps even some assistance from the Neomuni on Neptune. Episode 3, Heresy, would be the perfect excuse to tie in the Hive dynasty. Zivora Wrath, Oryx, Savathun, and Eris Morn. The story beat is particularly a big one, and it makes a lot of sense that it would lead to the wrapping up of some loose ends before the next big saga in Destiny. No one knows whether there is a fragment of the original collision of worlds that made up Fundament still exists, or where the entire planet is still around teeming with viable life. Fundament is an ancient gas giant and the birthplace of the Hive one of humanity's most formidable enemies. It has a harsh environment and is surrounded by 52 moons, one of which served as the home for the Worm Gods. Given the history of the Hive, and Heresy being the final episode before the next big thing in Destiny, it's possible appearances in the Frontier franchise could reveal more about the origins of the Hive and possibly introduce new challenges for us as Guardians. The Book of Sorrow tells us about the conquest of the Hive, led by Oryx, the Taken King. However, the Book of Sorrows is a book of lies. So, for all we know, there is an entire contingent out there of races still living actively on Fundament that we haven't been aware of all this time. There is also a very strong possibility of the original mother of the Krill returning, Teox, tutor of the Osmium heirs the Osmium Mother. Before Savathun was the Mother Morph, before Savathun, it was she who ruled by the Proto-Hive King's side. 
That was until she organised a coup against her own people, for reasons which are primarily unclear. We do have some idea, but how much of that is truth and how much of that is lies. Last but not least is 2082 Volantis, known as a Forge Star. It is a blue hypergiant star system colonised by the Vex. The system seems to lack planets, which may have been transformed or dismantled to build the array orbiting the Vex satellite megastructure that was involved in prolonging the life of the star and harvesting its heavy elements formed in its heart. The system, first discovered by Clovis Bray I and one other person, who had been thought to be Maya Sundaresh. Anyone else seeing the connective tissues here? Who had stolen a Vex unit from the Ishtar Collective and entered the Vex Gate, constructed in Europa that led into the system under the instructions of Clarity Control. There, he and several other researchers on the expedition deduced that the stone on one of the megastructures was 13 billion years old, Yet the star itself should not have been able to last this long, only to realise that the Vex had been artificially keeping it alive. Here Clovis Bray collected Vex radioloria samples that he would eventually use to create Alkahist, used to successfully create exoframes. It wasn't until hundreds of years later that Eremis, Kel of House Darkness, would unlock the gate, allowing Belmon, transcendent mind to invade Europa from the Forge Star with an army of transcendent Hydras. Fascinating, right? The link here is that from Europa we have a physical link leading to another system entirely, although the planets within that system seem to have vanished, but it presents a fascinating concept. And we're yet to see if whatever is happening on Nessus and the Vex will affect the entirety of the Vex code, potentially causing all the Vex in the known system to undergo a transformation, or whether this event is locked to local Vex of the Centaur. Whatever the case, this is a major story beat that would allow humanity to move out beyond the reef, the asteroid belt, or even the heliopause. Before we go, I think it's important for us to make a mention of the last AI, and this one cannot be trusted for any reason whatsoever, and that is Clovis Bray himself. He is hell-bent on becoming a god, and it is imperative that we lock down a lot of Rasputin's core systems, Seraph bunkers and more. If Clovis gets his hands on these facilities, there's nothing to stop him from developing another war mind or becoming one himself. I have no doubt in my mind that he will be particularly interested in the evolution of the Vex, and what it could do to further his developments of the Exos. Clovis doesn't want anything bad to happen to humanity, then it would be logical to assume he would have a vested interest in seeing a positive outcome, while similarly benefiting from all the data collected. Only time will tell. But that's all I have for you today. Hopefully you have enjoyed watching and listening to this one. It took a long time to research and script and record and edit, but my goal was to make this a frontier composite before bigger developments arrive. If you did enjoy it, feel free to leave a comment. Let me know, which galaxy or system do you think humanity will go to next in Destiny? And if you'd like to see more Destiny videos like this, subscribe and click the bell to find out when my next lore video goes live. Remember, that no matter what you're facing at this moment in time, you can do all things. Stay safe, and Godspeed.